guests with us. Welcome this morning. Uh, we are going through the book of Matthew. And how many of you noticed that we skipped to the end of the book, right? Because of Easter, we talked about the crucifixion of Christ and then the resurrection of Christ and then his instructions to his followers to take the good news, the message about him to the whole world. So uh, that's where we ended up. Today, we're going to backtrack just a bit and in the next six weeks, actually, for, so for the next seven uh, weeks here, we are going to look at um, some of Jesus' teaching that is found in the Gospel of Matthew. Next week, we're going to look at the importance of loving God and loving people as followers of Jesus. Uh, we'll then look at parables. What do they mean? What, what are they about? And then we're going to look for four weeks at the return of Christ. So we're going to go back and look at some of Christ's teaching. Today, we're going to look at his teaching uh, when it comes to marriage, singleness, and divorce. And uh, so what we're going to do is work our way through the text this morning, and then we're going to look at what does it mean to be under the rule of Christ? What does it mean, to, what does it look like under the rule of Christ if I'm married? What does it look like if I'm uh, single? And what does it look like if I'm divorced? Now, I just want to say before we begin, I understand uh, that what we're talking about today is a um, uh, sensitive topic. Uh, some of you might, this might trigger a few feelings, and I just want you to know that I'm going to try to be as sensitive as I can as we work through uh, the text this morning. So Matthew chapter 19, let's begin, and we're going to begin in verse 3. Verses 1 and 2, tell, Matthew tells us that Jesus has come from the north, Galilee, down to the south, Judea, the area of Jerusalem. And he's been two years, he's very popular up in the north. But his reputation has preceded him as he makes his way to the south. Large crowds there come to him and, and he heals them. But what we find is, as he's now in the south, he's heading towards the cross and the opposition from the religious leaders is going to increase. This movement where Jesus is supposedly this Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, they are trying to shut it down. And so they're going to try to trap him. And so that's where we pick up in verse 3. So he's talking, we're talking this morning, marriage, singleness, and divorce. So Matthew writes, some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? So Jesus, give us your opinion on divorce. Can you divorce for any reason or no reason? What's your opinion? And at the very least, they were hoping that his answer that he'd say the wrong answer, and that the public would turn from him. They'd stop following him. But what they truly were hoping for is that he'd say something to incriminate himself and so that he'd be killed. John the Baptist, at the same time of Jesus, spoke out against King Herod Antipas, who divorced his wife to marry his sister-in-law. John the Baptist said, you know, he spoke out against that, and things didn't go so well for him. And so they're hoping that Jesus, too, will say the wrong answer. Here's the question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now, this question comes from Deuteronomy 24, where Moses gives instructions that in a certain case that a woman, we'll get to there, that in a moment, is to be given a certificate of divorce. If something is found um, to be uh, accepted. Uh, uh, sorry, let me get this right here. There are a, there's a certain condition for a man to give a woman a certificate of divorce. And the question was, what was that exception? What was the, 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 um, the cause for divorce? There were two schools of thought among the religious leaders, among the Pharisees. One school, one group followed the rabbi called Rabbi Shammai, who was very conservative. And he said, the only reason you could divorce your wife is for sexual indecency, sexual immorality. The other a group followed Rabbi Hillel, who was more popular, and said you could divorce your wife for any and every reason. And we find in the Mishnah a number of those reasons listed. You could divorce your wife if you didn't like the way that she was cooking. You could divorce your wife if you didn't like her appearance, if she had bushy eyebrows. Divorce her. And the list just went down and down. Right? Jesus, what is it? Is it just one case or all of the cases. And what is very interesting among the religious leaders and in this male-dominated culture, 
the people posing this, uh, many of them were chauvinistic. They were selfish. They treated women badly and their wives badly. In that culture, what was happening was there were women who were being, they were left by their husband to marry another woman, and they were using Deuteronomy 24. Oh, Moses gave us permission as, uh, as a text to legitimize just cycling through women. So divorce was easy for the men. Jesus, in his response, doesn't enter into the debate on this level. Say, well, let's talk about divorce. I think it's for this reason or this reason. Jesus takes them back to God's original intention for marriage. He's going to confront this disposable mind, marriage mindset, this, this uh, culture of just easy divorce. It's similar to our culture today, right? Kind of marriage, and if it doesn't work out, I'll just move on. He's confronting that. He's challenging that, and he takes them back to the creation account, Genesis 1 and 2, and he actually quotes Genesis 2, 24. Jesus responds, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus says, don't you understand that divorce is not God's will? God's will is that he made the male and female, the first male, a bunch of animals, rest of creation, but God makes a female as well. They're different. He makes them male and female. And for this reason, because of that then, they, uh, when they come together in the relationship of marriage, that the, that the man is to leave his father and mother, the idea that this relationship is tr to transcend all other relationships. This relationship is so important. And that he is to be united to his wife, glued together, bonded together, and that they then are to become one flesh. The two will become one. And then he says, what God has joined together, men are not to separate. So he brings them back to God's original intention for marriage. Verse 7, why then? They asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. Notice there that they said, Moses commanded us to give a certificate of divorce. And Jesus corrects them. No, he didn't command you. He permitted you. It was a concession. What was happening? So we asked the question, why did, if, if marriage is God's will, why did God make a concession for divorce? Two reasons, that, two primary reasons. Uh, the first one is because God wanted to protect the weak and the vulnerable. And in this context, it was the women. In the first century, in, in, in the ancient Near East, and in particular in Israel, the man had all the cards. He had all the power. And so what was happening was a man would just leave his wife and then marry another. And he wouldn't give her a certificate of divorce, which meant that she would have to, in almost all the cases, go into prostitution because she couldn't go and support herself. In the first century, women didn't get jobs. They didn't have jobs to support themselves. There were no safety nets, nothing, no government, no help. And so they had to turn some of them to, many of them to prostitution. And so God hates that. And so to protect the woman, he says, you've got to give her a certificate of divorce if you leave her. It was to help her so that she could remarry and have a means of support back in that day. The second reason is God gave it to protect the institution of marriage. The, 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 what had happened was, is that there were so many loopholes, marriage really was a sham. And so uh, God said, no, you have to have this certificate. So that's a concession that was made. And Jesus tells us why the concession was made. Notice, it's because your hearts were hard. Why do people get divorced? Because one or both have hard hearts that their hearts are not soft towards God and his will and his word and the spirit of God working in their lives. When a heart is hard, it moves away from God and his will. Today we say, we call it irreconcilable differences. You know, we can't get along with our finances. We disagree about sex. Uh, we're different career paths, different dreams, different personalities. It's just irre irreconcilable differences. But to God, someone's got a hard heart. That's the reason. So Jesus, again, says, from the beginning, 
God's will is that marriage lasts forever. It's lifelong. But then he gives us this exception clause. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So he says, you stay together. But he says, if someone commits sexual immorality, now the Greek word is porneia, which is a broad term uh, for sexual immorality. In this particular context, it's referring to adultery, one spouse having sex with someone that's not their spouse. And why does God make, Jesus make the concession? Because it's a sad necessity. If someone, and the idea here is that it's ongoing. Someone is breaking the marital bond, and there's no repentance, and there's a sexual immorality. That breaks it. And in light of that, there, that's an exception clause. Uh, I will say, too, uh, that that's even in those situations where a, a marriage bond has been broken, God is a God who seeks to forgive and restore and, and God has done that in the lives of couple. But if someone breaks the covenant and just uh, continues in their sexual morality, that's an exception clause. The question is, are there other exceptions? Well, Paul gives us another one in 1 Corinthians 7, the case of, uh, of an unbeliever that abandons the believer. Jesus is speaking primarily about marriage to a Jewish audience here. In uh, Paul's case, he's speaking to a non-Jewish audience, to, the, to people in Corinth. And what was happening in that day was people that didn't know Jesus were getting married. Then one of them heard the good news about Jesus, became a Christian. And so the Christians were asking, now that I'm a follower of Jesus, do I stay in this marriage? Because maybe my spouse mocks me or doesn't like me going to worship or what should I do? And Paul says, don't go you stay because you could be a sanctifying influence not only on him, but if you have children, on your children as well. But then Paul says, but if the unbeliever who you're married to abandons you or deserts you, then that breaks the marriage bond as well. So there's a couple exceptions. And we will add here at Woodside that we're, we're followers of Jesus who are full of grace and truth. We would recognize other exceptions as well. Um, again, we hold marriage in, in, uh, with a high view but, but there are other, uh, other exceptions in addition to those two. For example, if someone's in a marriage and they're being beaten, physically abused, verbally abused, and destroyed, we don't say to that person, well, you have to stay in that marriage um, until your spouse either commits you know, sexual immorality or abandons you. Sorry, that, you know, no. We use wisdom and common sense. But all of this to say that it wasn't, God, that wasn't God's uh, will from the beginning. After this conversation, the disciples then uh, ask him a second question, or make a, a statement about the conversation. Verse 10. <clears throat> so this is kind of one-on-one with the disciples. This, the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. If God has such a high view of marriage, and really, you know, some of us used to hold to Rabbi Hillel's view, and some of us held to Rabbi Shammai's view. You're, you're elevating marriage even more. It's such a big deal to God. Maybe it's best we stay single for someone to be single. And it's interesting, Jesus doesn't contradict them and say, well, no, no, let me just soften a bit. Everybody should get married. No, what he does here now is he turns the conversation from marriage to singleness. And he elevates singleness, not above marriage, but he's affirming the calling of singleness. He, uh, he says, Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. And later he'll talk about accepting those who can accept it should accept it. So in other words, singleness is not for everybody, but for those that can accept it, it's a good thing. And then he describes people that are single. He says, for there are eunuchs. What's a eunuch? A eunuch was, anybody go by, I'm a eunuch, right? A eunuch is, was someone that is single and celibate. And he describes three types of people that are single and celibate. The first, he says, were born that way. In other words, it was natural. They're natural eunuchs because of their anatomy, because of desire. They are just single and celibate. And we're not going to go into any more detail at this point. Um, you can look in a commentary. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. Something unnatural took place, traumatic event, and they find themselves in that place. But here's what the point that Jesus wants to emphasize. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says there are some people who have chosen to be single and celibate because they are advancing the kingdom. And Jesus is elevating people that are single. Now, before we talk to the three different groups and kind of look like 
look at each of those scenarios. Just a, uh, three points about marriage uh, before we move on. First, God intended marriage to be good, okay? I was thinking of making a joke about marriage, right? We've heard lots of jokes, right? But marriage is good. It's a gift from God. It's good for companionship. It's not good for man to be alone. It's, it's good for a, a couple to come together and journey through life together. It's good for companionship. It's good for the social order. Back in Genesis 1 and 2, where, where God gives the creation mandate, he says, be fruitful and multiply. He says, to fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, take what I've given to you. You're made in my image. You are my representatives. Now go create culture. Go create societies. And the means by which you will do it, the fundamental means, will be marriage, will be uh, the husband and wife working together. And that structure will strengthen society, will give it stability, security, productivity. And there are studies that will tell you just the benefits of marriage in a society. It's good for the social area, uh, order. And then third, it's good for maturity. God's main purpose of marriage wasn't for you to be happy. It was for you to be holy. He wants to use marriage to chip away and make us more like Jesus. It's sanctifying, a sanctifying environment. It's good for us to mature. What happens when you take two broken people, two different people, different backgrounds, different genders, different personalities, and maybe throw in a child or some children who have needs? Uh, what happens when you do that? It's not a joke, um, it, but here's the reality. You're going to end up with tension and conflict right? You've got two different people that are imperfect, and you've got this tension and conflict, and God wants to chip away using uh, your spouse to refine your character, to make you like Jesus. So maybe today after the message, you can go home and just, man, God is using you, my, my, using you in my life. Thank you. You're just a beautiful tool, Lord. Okay, again, I'm not too funny, but anyway, just hang in there. Um, the idea there is that in a marriage, I'm learning to love learning to sacrifice, learning to journey through life that someone, that, with someone that's different from me. I'm not called to be selfish, self-absorbed. Oh, this is a ball and chain. Yeah, if, if you want to be selfish and self-absorbed, yeah, it's a ball and chain. But marriage is a good thing. It matures us. A second uh, thing we learn about marriage is mar God intended marriage to be between one man and one woman. Uh, not between one man and two women or three women or more than that. Not between one man and one man or one woman and one woman. Not between a man and a robot. Okay, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. As followers of Jesus, we say that marriage predates civilization. It goes back uh, uh, to the first man or first woman. God himself walks the first uh, woman down the aisle and he's the author of marriage, but he also regulates marriage, that it's between a man and a woman. Now, what has happened in the last couple decades is that conversation, what is marriage, um, we've had that conversation, and marriage has been redefined. And it's interesting, with the same-sex conversation, the, the conversation moved from redefining marriage to equality. And as followers of Jesus, we're all for equality. We're not discriminating, people are not to discriminate against one another. We're all for equality. But Christians were saying in that conversation that let's call this union a civil union. Let's not call it marriage. Now, I just want to say in the, that conversation, there were Christians who misrepresented Christ. As followers of Christ, we are full of grace and truth. We don't, we're not controlling anything. But our voice was, is that call it something different because when you redefine marriage, you render it really the definition meaningless. So why not today in our culture, uh, why not say that marriage, uh, we can reconfigure it to mean what we want? For example, why can't a man be married to three or four women in our culture? Ten women. Who's to say that's wrong? Why can't a father marry his daughter? He would like the benefits and protection of marriage. There, do you know that there are fathers who want to marry their daughters in our, cult, in our world? Uh, there are mothers who want to marry their sons. Why can't they? 
Uh, what about, uh, there's something called polyamory that's uh, kind of picking up steam in our culture. There's advocates for polyamory, which means that you have uh, one person and another person, and they want to get married and have multiple partners. Well, not all married, but some would say, uh, we'd like to be married, but we'd like to have multiple partners, kind of group marriage. Two women, two men, three men, three women. A group marriage where we all are in knowledge of it and we all consent to it. Uh, and then the, the sex with the robot, a lady in the UK would like to marry her robot. And before we think she's crazy, let me just tell you that they are working on robots where in, in a few years from now, human beings will be able to have sex with a robot. So who knows what marriage is going to look like 20 years from now. The point is, is that God's original intent was between one man and one woman. When you redefine it, uh, it, it renders the meaning, the, the definition meaningless. And then third, God intended marriage to be unbroken. To God, being married is a big deal. It's a sacred covenant. It's not simply a ceremony. Oh, let's do the marriage thing and have a ceremony. It's not a social contract where, you know what, we'll, we'll enter into this union. If you do your part, I'll do my part, and we'll see if it works or if the feelings last. It's not a social contract. It's not a piece of paper. Oh, why do we need, you know, marriage? It's just a piece of paper. No, in God's eyes, it's more than a piece of paper. It's a union of two people. Uh, it's a big deal. Okay, so let's talk first to those of you that are married. Are you under the rule of Christ in your marriage? I'd like to suggest three things that we ought to be uh, embracing this morning in light of Genesis 2.24, the, the uh, verse that Jesus mentioned. First, when he talks about leaving your father and mother, it's this idea of making this new relationship a priority. He's talking about not letting uh, parents or anything else interfere with this relationship. And today, I don't know about you, especially you young uh, uh, couples, if you have parents that interfere, hopefully you don't, but what can happen is, is you can let activities and other things interfere with your marriage. Time is the currency of any relationship, and God's desire is that this relationship is a priority, so you are intentionally investing time in your marriage, which means if you have to work two jobs or three jobs to pay for a big mortgage, and a big house, but it's at the expense of, of, of having no time with your spouse, you need to downsize. You need to get in a smaller house so that you have time together. It means if you have children, your children, if you've got them involved in 10 activities and you as a couple never have time for each other, you need to reduce that to fewer activities. You're purposely making time for each other. And I just want to encourage you with young children, when you're just trying to get through the week, you know, a survival mode one week to the next, that you need to, from time to time, have a date with your spouse. You're investing in it. You're, 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 you're uh, making it a priority. Interesting, uh, an association of divorce law lawyers looking at social media came out just recently with an article on five ways that social media uh, can hurt a marriage and, and kind of what they've, they've uh, observed. And number one was screen time got in the way of FaceTime. Right? Screens are okay, but you don't just want to come home and you're both on your own screens all night long and you never talk with one another. So under the rule of Christ means we're making our marriage a priority, we're spending time, making time to be with one another. And I know that's, that's uh, not easy, and it's complex at times, so um, I understand that, but that's, that's what we need to be striving towards. Secondly, uh, under the rule of Christ, you realize that your marriage is a lifelong commitment, that you are united, bonded together. Marriage and love is a lot of things, but its essence is commitment. When you are a, uh, a couple promising, uh, uh, declaring your current love as you share your vows, you're also declaring or promising a future love. It's not just, oh, we love each other right now, but I'm going to love you until the day I die, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others till death do us part. I'm making that promise. Uh, Dietrich, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, who was imprisoned by the Nazis and eventually died in uh, prison, 
uh, was asked to do his niece's, funer- uh, niece's funeral, niece's wedding, and, uh, but he couldn't make it. But we have a copy of his sermon. And in his sermon, he said something really profound. He said, today you are young and very much in love, and you think that your love will sustain your marriage. It won't. But your marriage can sustain your love. Wonderful quote. In other words, for the young couple getting married, don't think that those feelings of love are going to carry you through. There's going to be times where there'll be ebb and flow. There will be dry spells. But rather, when you choose to honor your commitment, to honor your vows, that will engender love. Actions of love lead to feelings of love. So for those of you that are getting married, just want to give you the heads up, about 18 months in, uh, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, you realize you wake up and you're like, well, I don't, my feelings have changed a bit. They're not there every day. That's okay. That's good. We're okay. But it's your commitment to your marriage, those vows, that will help you to, to make it last a lifetime. Okay, I hope I, did I say that right? Did everybody get that? Kind of following? Okay, good. Uh, just want to take a, a moment, though, and recognize um, just a couple of different situations. If you're here this morning and you're struggling with your commitment in marriage, you think that maybe your marriage is hopeless or you're in a pit that's too deep or, uh, or you think it's too late, I want to share the good news with you this morning that with Jesus, all things are possible. And the way ahead for you is, uh, as, as a couple is for both of you to soften your heart. God, soften my heart to your word, your will, your spirit. What do you want me to change? What do you want me to do? And when God has two hearts, he works out miracles. He does his work. And so there is hope. If you're here, however, oh, by the way, I just want to give, uh, share something too. As a young uh, pastor and newly married, I remember going to a conference of a big, known, well-known speaker, travels the world, and pastor, and he shared with us as pastors, and he said, I want to tell you something. When I first started as a pastor, I got so involved in the church that my wife and I, we started to drift apart. And he said, we went to counseling, and uh, we had no money at the time, and he said, we had to put 10000 I think it was about $10,000, he said, on our MasterCard, right? Not for going in debt, but we spent $10,000 in counseling uh, with our marriage, and he said, it was so, or it is so worth it. And he encouraged us, and I'm encouraging you, if you're stuck in a marriage, counseling is so worth it uh, to stick it out. So if you have two people with hard hearts, they need to be softened. But what if you're here this morning and you're struggling with your commitment because your partner has a hard heart? Your partner is mean or abusive, or your partner um, is uh, emotionally checked out and they don't want to make the marriage work. In that situation, You've got to look to your heart and say, God, soften my heart, realizing you can't change that person, but yet God can work in your heart as you continue to pray for that person. So it's a lifelong commitment. And then third, under the rule of Christ, you understand that marriage is more than just being happy. God's desire is that we would be holy, that we would be one. And happiness is a byproduct of happiness. As a couple, the more that you come together uh, as one, that physically, emotionally, spiritually you are close, that the more you will be happy. And which means, can I just say again to all of our young couples, that uh, if you're going to get there, it means you've got to have a lot of conversations. And some of them are difficult conversations. I remember when I was first married to my wife, uh, for the first two years of our marriage, we had some conversations because, again, I just, well, she's different than me. And she realized, that guy's a loser, or that guy's different than me, right? They just, wow. And at times, it was frustrating. At times, we were just, wow. But we've learned over the years to put, you know, some ground rules in effect so we can have a conversation where we are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So God wants to work in your marriage and you sit at a table or go for a walk and you're not taking it personally, but you're working through different differences. Falling in love is easy, but staying in love takes courage, hard work, and lots of grace. And it is worth it. 
We at Woodside here want to support marriages. We offer the Alpha Marriage Course uh, in the coming year. We're planning to offer maybe one or two marriage courses. We're, we're planning, hopefully, a marriage conference. Uh, we have our care ministry where uh, you can uh, get care in the church. And we also um, uh, refer for counseling. Just want to encourage you, if you're struggling in your marriage, to, to get help. We're all for marriages here at Woodside. If you're here this morning and you're divorced, and you, uh, as a follower of Jesus, you recognize that it wasn't God's will, that from the beginning this was not to be God's intent, and you recognize that, you confess that, I also want to challenge you this morning to come under the rule of Christ and let him heal you, that he would continue that process of healing. God, Jesus, does not want us to go through life full of bitterness, condemnation, guilt, shame. Forgiveness is not the unforgivable sin. That your divorce does not define you. Jesus defines you. New life in Christ defines you. And you are, that's how you are to see yourself. I am a follower of Jesus. Yes, this happened, and I wished it didn't, but I am moving forward. God, continue to heal me. And I want to encourage you, too, if you have kids, that you would teach your kids to honor marriage um, and help them as they uh, might consider that. Jesus did not come in the world to condemn us, but he came to save us. And for th those of you that are adorers, you find yourself, God loves you and he wants to heal you. And I want to say to us as a church, on the one hand, uh, we're not uh, to, we don't condemn people that are divorced. We don't see them as second class Christians. Uh, we don't look down on them. They are one with us, and we are one together in Christ, so we don't do that. But on the other hand, we don't act glibly uh, as if the divorce didn't happen, never happened, or it's no big deal. Again, it's the, the truth and grace um, scenario as followers of Jesus. So marriage is a big deal, but if you, if you are from a failed marriage, God still loves you. He still wants to work in your life, and we are one together. Okay, can I go on? Is everybody okay? Right here? Okay, third one. If you are single, if you're here this morning and you sense, you know what? Maybe God is calling me to be single. I don't really think I need to be married. I want to remind you that Jesus affirms that. That's a good thing. Uh, for you that are in that place, I would encourage you to reject the marriage equals completion myth. As one fellow said to his girl, or the, you complete me, remember? And then she's like, just kind of stop talking. You had me at hello, you know? And there's this idea that I need that one in my life to complete me. That's not true. You see followers of Jesus who were complete as singles. John the Baptist, Paul, we believe, was single, or at least he was a widower for most of his life. Mary and Martha uh, were single. Ma Mary Magdalene was single. Jesus himself was single. So as a single person, you sense that calling to be single? Jesus affirms that. That's good. Second thing I'd say to you, remind you, is under the rule of Christ, you want to use your singleness, as Jesus said in Matthew 19, to advance the kingdom of heaven. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 7, to use your singleness, yeah, to leverage um, your time and attention and your gifts for the cause of Christ that you are, whether it's locally or globally, you're involved uh, in, in the good news of Jesus, whether that's in word or deed, helping with social justice initiatives, whether it's teaching kids, whether it's caring for the poor. So use your singleness uh, for his glory. And then third, that you would get in community. Uh, it's not good for any of us to, to be alone. We're all called to journey life uh, with people. So get into a communion. Make sure you're in a community. Uh, if you're here this morning and you're single, but you don't necessarily sense a calling to be single, you kind of have the sense, you know what, I think I would like to be uh, married. Uh, to you, I would encourage you to reject the right person myth, right? The myth that's out there that I've got to find the right person, and until I find the right person, I can't be happy. That right person, you know, I'm just on the quest to find the right person. Reject that. You're, you're in life. You do not want to be living for the right person. You want to be living for Jesus. 
And Jesus says, and his word says, that it's not all about finding the right person. If you look at scripture, if you're single this morning, say, I want to get married, you're not going to find in here God's instructions on how to exactly find the right person, right? Go to church, go to the cafe after church, don't bring a Starbucks coffee, drink the coffee at church, it's good, you don't want to give the wrong impression, um, you know, wear blue, and then as you're sitting down, please sit down, at the right time, I'll bring the right person across. They're going to go to the washroom, but you can kind of make eye contact and we'll work it out from there, right? Okay. It doesn't mean as a single person that you're not saying, hmm, Christian mingle, e-harmony, going to church, uh, that, there, there is a place for that. But your focus and your quest is not on finding the right person. As you live for Jesus, your focus is on becoming the right person. While I'm single, Jesus softened my heart so that I am learning to be more loving, more peaceful, more compassionate, uh, that I'm more of a giving person than a getting person, and trusting that God at the right time will bring the right person across your path. And I've seen that over and over again in every situation. Because does God always do that? No, there's the exception. But uh, my wife, I, we've talked about this. There's been situations where I couple in particular, I said, there's no way that person, you know, wants to be married. There's no way. And sure enough, God answered. And uh, th- those people are in, in uh, marriages today. So be, as, uh, if you're single and want to be married, uh, reject the right person myth and focus on becoming the right person. And then for those of you, uh, whether you're single and you're, you feel you're called to be single, they're not called, and for us as married uh, people as well, that we uh, would Uh, honor God's word when it comes to our sexuality. Being single as a follower of Jesus means that you are celibate. In our culture today, that is not what we hear. Listen to a pop singer, and I'm not, again, we're not uh, cursing culture, we're to create culture, but we are to point out where culture is wrong and where songs are wrong and movies are wrong. And I'll be honest with you, I'll turn on the radio sometimes, I can hear a song or I can watch a movie and I can just say, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie. And the problem is, there's a way that seems right to us, but it ends in death. And I just want to share, if you're single here, you can follow the world, but you'll never win in the end. You always lose. That doesn't mean that if you've gone down that road that you can't seek forgiveness and, Lord, I want to get on the right road. But in your life, you want to honor God with your body. It's a challenge. It's hard. But you're saying, I'm going to be celibate. And I want to tell you as singles, there are singles who are celibate, who have uh, uh, an attraction to the opposite sex, and there are singles who are celibate and have an attraction to the same sex. Again, same-sex attraction is not sin. But it's what you do with that. And there are followers of Jesus who are saying, for the kingdom of heaven, I'm going to honor God with my body. Is it hard? Yes, it is. But you need to be in that battle and honor him. And then I want to speak to those of us that are married. Uh, For us, we have that battle as well, uh, in particular with pornography, uh, where we can uh, turn our attention to to the opposite, to to, uh, people that are not uh, our spouse. Uh, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, he says, if you lust in a woman in your heart, lust for a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. So what he's saying there, it's not enough that you uh, have physical monogamy, but you need to have mental monogamy. You need to put away sin and put on righteousness. Your eyes are to be for your spouse only. And so, again, that's a battle. And we at the church here, we want to help. So, again, we're all in this together and, um, and we want to do the right thing. And by the way, where the culture is going and, you know, all the different uh, things when it comes to sexual immorality, it's n- sexual immorality is nothing new. And you just look at history and civilizations. Righteousness exalts a nation, and, but sin is a reproach to any people. Um, when you go down in the way of unrighteousness, sooner or later there are consequences. So singles want to encourage you and all of us uh, to follow God's design for sex. And then for, uh, uh, for us here at Woodside that aren't single, okay, please don't go around to single people in this church and say, why aren't you married? Okay, you know, there's something wrong? Not at all. 
God calls people to singleness, and that's a good thing. Now, if the person wants to be single, that's when you can say, hey, I have a nice nephew that's a Christian or a nice niece, and can we work something out, okay? But we, we realize that singleness is affirmed by Jesus. I'd like to uh, end with this uh, statement, this truth. Neither marriage, divorce, nor singleness will carry over into the kingdom of heaven. Wherever you find yourself this morning, that's not going to last. When we see Jesus, our faith is turned to sight, we will uh, be united with him for all eternity. And uh, the kingdom of heaven is much, much bigger and greater than our marriages, our divorces, and our singleness.